Well, it's time for Iron Eagle 3, aka Ace's Iron Eagle 3. How will this one be different, you might ask? Well, we have Cocaine, a femme Rambo bodybuilder, Nazis, and the Street Fighter himself, Sonny Chiba. Are you in? Maybe you should just say no. Ace's Iron Eagle 3 came along in 1992 after Iron Eagle 2 did extremely well on home video. This time, series director Sidney J. Fury was very busy with Ladybugs and The Taking of Beverly Hills, so the producers pulled off quite a coup and got 007 director John Glenn to step in and direct the picture. Glenn was an established editor of Bond pictures, including my personal favorite, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and Moonraker. He then went on to direct For Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, A View to a Kill, The Living Daylights, and License to Kill. After having killed off the character of Doug Masters in the opening scene of Part 2 and replacing him with a cardboard discount Tom Cruise cutout, the lead of Part 2, Mark Humphrey, was never heard from again. But Louis Gossett Jr. as Chappie Sinclair was game for some more aerial hijinks and wisely they got his character in the air again, whereas in Part 2 he was grounded for the entire runtime. This time, Chappie is helping run a traveling vintage WW2 aircraft show in Texas where they take turns shooting paint pellets at each other. This was a great way to reintroduce Chappie, and it seemed like a thing that he would be doing at this stage in his life. Joining him are a cast of racial stereotypes that seem written from an action figure laden floor of a six year old's room. But alas, it is written yet again by Iron Eagle series vet Kevin Elders. We have the British plane flown by Palmer, portrayed by Christopher Casanova. Still no match for the spit, I'm afraid. The German plane is flown by Ernst, played by Horst Buchholz, who you might recognize from The Magnificent Seven, of course, to which this film plays numerous homages to. And then we have our Japanese plane, flown by everyone's favorite street fighter, Sonny Chiba. Woo! Supporting cast is also impressive, with what was supposed to be a star-turning introductory role for female bodybuilding champ Rachel McLish as Anna. And the bad guys here are also impressive, because not only do we get the heavy from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Paul Freeman, doing his Moloch impression, but the main heavy from Crocodile Dundee 2 and Kinjite Forbidden Subjects, Juan Fernandez. So it's almost an alternative universe where the Raiders and Crocodile Dundee franchises joined up to kill the Iron Eagle franchise. You're late. Chappie is summoned to take a look at what remains of his friend's plane and tells the audience that, well, most of my friends get shot down, but this one happens to have a bodybuilding sister who's like Rambo and shit, but she's being held hostage to a Nazi in Peru with her father. Oh, what to do. If only I had some pilots to lead a mission to Peru, wouldn't that be cool? Anna is able to escape because she has some serious arms, dude. I mean, look at those things. Those are deadly serious. She vows to kill all Nazis and save her father, but alas, she needs air support. Along the way, Anna is sexually assaulted by Ray Boom Boom Mancini in his career introducing role as the rapist Chico. You can't do this. Watch me. Nice choice there, Ray. But also on this trip, we have what might be the most horrendous character in this rogues gallery of stereotypes, TV. Yo ho ho, <laughs> Santa Claus is here. Santa went straight to the ghetto. <laughs> his scenes are so cringe that we just hope he hangs back after his first few scenes, but uh, sadly he flies coach and ends up being the comic relief to Rachel McLish's character, Anna. Relax. My legs! I can't feel my legs! They're dead! How does this happen? How, how, how does this get written? I, I'm at a loss here. 
Who's dead, dig, rap? Like, uh, my name is TV, and I'm here to say that I am a rapping brother, and I'm here to stay. Ah! Yo, baby, that was my best Eddie Murphy imitation. Hey, how you doing? It's showtime, so let's get busy. Chappie and his band of stereotypes take to the air to take on the Peruvian chapter of the Nazis, where World War II planes go head-to-head -head with jets, while McLish gets to go full Rambo. Thankfully, TV is captured, but unfortunately, McLish rescues him and her father, so we can have more exchanges such as this. TV, is that you? None other, baby. I flew him for the surprise party, baggage class. Did you know that if someone fires a missile at you in midair, all you have to do is open the window and throw a roll of aluminum foil out the window and boom! If only George Kennedy had known about this in Airport 79. Once the Peru jets intercept our WW2 buds, things get interesting when action figures start to fall out of planes for some reason. This is actual footage from the film. I did not shoot this myself for this video, I swear to God. All joking aside, it is great to see Chappie back in the air fighting. That makes this entry instantly more fun than the generic part two. Chappie has good chemistry with his contemporaries here, and even though they are towing a heavy line of stereotypes, it is fun in spots. And it recalls classics like The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape. Director John Glenn shows off some great action set pieces from time to time. Unfortunately, they are mainly on the ground, the highlight being this scene. But overall, this isn't up to the quality of a Bond pitcher, or even an Iron Eagle pitcher for that matter. But I'm sure Glenn wasn't dealing with that kind of budget, because at this point the Iron Eagle films were fast approaching the direct-to-video market, and yet Glenn manages to maintain a fun level of action regardless. What you smell is in your pants. Take a whiff of this. There is no cool soundtrack, or even one song to rock to. They seem to have lost the budget for the licensing of any songs at this point. Gossett, though, seems very engaged in this one as Chappie, as opposed to the last entry. McLish is the film's wild card here. She's really great to look at on screen and has a real presence. And one has to think, had she been in, say, a different film, would she have been a huge action star in the 90s, maybe? She clearly has that it factor. In fact, you can totally see her as a Bond villain or even a Bond girl. She starred in a follow-up to this, also written by Kevin Elders, called Ravenhawk directed by Albert Poon. Noticed I haven't talked about the great Sonny Chiba in a while. Well, yeah, that, uh, that just happened. Chappie goes head to head with Moloch because that dang covenant he has on one of those trucks has some coke in it. But not to worry, Mr. Jones got here earlier and made everything right. Not many Peruvian Nazi adventure flicks end with a Texas barbecue scene, but this one does. Plus, LGJ just looks so fine in a cowboy hat, don't he? Let's all have some ribs, y'all. Nice hat.